was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you celebrating how blessed we are to live in this amazing and free country this Sunday morning. I'm Mike Schrader. I'm the men's pastor here at Mission Hills Church, and it is great to be with you virtually, um, coming to you from under the tent here on our property at church. I'm standing where we were so blessed to have our first physical meeting uh, properly um, distanced socially and with all the right safety precautions this last Sunday, the 28th of June. And it was great to be together physically and worship God together and learn from his word. Now, we'll continue to do that 
each Sunday morning at nine o'clock here on campus physically, but we'll also have the virtual um, service at 9 a.m. as well, which you're watching today. So please attend either way, uh, whatever you feel is most convenient and safe for you. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I wanted to specifically welcome you. Um, Mission Hills Church is a great community of people who love God and, uh, quite frankly, are just some amazing people. And so uh, it's a blessing to gather together uh, virtually or physically, and you're in a good place. If you could, however, if you're new uh, and this is your first time uh, checking in with us online, um, if you could just send us an email at, Mission Hill, at info at missionhillschurch.com, that's info at missionhillschurch.com, then we can get you plugged into life here at the church. And we, we do have a variety of activities that are going on, uh, whether it's for men's or women's, college, high school, youth or children, a variety of connection points, and we want to get you plugged in. Speaking of children, on Friday, July 10th uh, at 6 p.m. here on campus, uh, we're going to be having our first of three family nights uh, throughout the summer. And this is a time where we'll physically gather on campus, again, safe and socially distanced with all the right safety precautions. But we'll gather on campus to have an interactive worship session for those families that have children literally from birth all the way to sixth grade. We'll have a short lesson, we'll worship together, uh, we'll play some games, and we're gonna have a ton of fun. So I wanna make sure that you're aware of that. Put it on your calendars for July 10th at 6 p.m. where we'll gather here together. And that'll be our first of three family nights for families with uh, children ages birth all the way through sixth grade. So that's 6 p.m. on July 10th, uh, a Friday night. So come on and join us in that. All right, uh, lastly, I wanted to just thank you for your continued financial contributions to the work that God is doing here at Mission Hills Church and through us into the community. Uh, that, that work continues on and has even during the quarantine and um, the peculiar times as we're facing as a nation. So if you're interested in furthering that work, you can go onto our website at missionhillschurch.com. You can go up to the top right, there's a little button that says give, and you can just click on that, and it'll kind of walk you through the process of how to do that. For now, if you could, just join us as we continue uh, with the worship team in singing songs of praise as we worship God together. Thanks and have a great morning. From Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfy your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Great thing. 
above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted. Well, happy Sunday to everybody and happy 4th of July weekend. I trust you had a great day yesterday and that even though it's a bit different or quite a bit different than normal 4th of July weekends, I really do hope that this is a, a wonderful weekend for you. And I'm glad that we can be together again on a Sunday morning to focus on God, to thank Him, to praise Him, and to look to His Word. All right, so it's great to be with you as it always is. All right, well, on December 31st, 1946, President Harry Truman officially declared the end to World War II. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong planted his foot on the surface of the moon with a half a billion people watching, and he declared, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And on July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress of the 13 North American colonies formally announced its separation from Great Britain by way of the greatest document in our nation's history, that of course, the Declaration of Independence. Declarations are made for all sorts of reasons, but none rise to the importance or the impact, to the significance or to the meaning of the declaration made by God through his servant Paul in the first sentence of chapter 8 of the book of Romans. And you're thinking, okay, what's God's declaration in the first sentence, in the first verse of chapter 8 of the book of Romans? It's this. There is now, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's right. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for anyone who is in, which means who belongs to Christ Jesus. There is no better news. There is no better news. There cannot possibly be a better declaration than that one. After all that we know of ourselves, after all that I know of myself, after all that we know of humanity, after all Paul has explained in the first seven chapters of Romans, to read that statement in the first line of chapter 8 is stunning. It's breathtaking. It's, as we say, jaw-dropping. We scratch our heads. We pinch ourselves. Can it really be the case that there's no condemnation? After everything we've done, is it really the case that there's no condemnation for what we've done? That's the case. 
To say that mankind has not responded to God as it ought to have responded is the understatement of all time. The most fundamental problem of the human race is that we have, what? Disregarded God. We've cast Him aside. We've dishonored Him as God. That is our sin. It's mine. It's yours. It's everyone's. Every human who's ever lived. Words really are inadequate to describe the degree of wrongness that mankind has leveled against God who deserves nothing other than our honor, our trust, our worship, and our obedience. Words are inadequate, but John Piper has tried to describe it. He explains the heart of mankind's sin in this way. The glory of God is not honored. The holiness of God is not, re is not reverenced. The greatness of God is not admired. The power of God is not praised. The truth of God is not sought. The wisdom of God is not esteemed. The beauty of God, it's not treasured. The goodness of God, it's not savored. The faithfulness of God is not trusted. The promises of God are not relied upon. The commandments of God are not respected. The wrath of God is not feared. The grace of God is not cherished. The presence of God is not prized. And the person of God is not loved. Wow. Words are inadequate, but I'd say Piper does a pretty good job of explaining how we collectively and individually have failed our Creator, the infinite, all-glorious God of the universe, has been regarded as a non-issue, not only as obsolete, but a non-entity altogether, absolutely unnecessary. And that's the ultimate outrage, that we would see God as a non-issue, unnecessary, and I've been a party to it. My life came in a long line of human beings before me who simply have sinned by discrediting, not valuing, not following God. And the results of all that, well, it's evil. Again, we use lots of words because words do fail us in describing how far we've fallen from the aspirations that God had for mankind when he created us and called us what? The crown of his creation. We've fallen quite a ways. And we see it today, if I might add. You know, we wonder why people don't get along, right? At the core of the social upheaval of our country today is not so much that we don't care about each other. It's not that you don't care about me and I don't care about you, but to whatever degree that may be true, it is because none of us has cared as we ought to have cared about the God who by his love and by his grace has given us breath, the breath of life. All mistreatment of others, listen closely, all mistreatment of others originates with the mistreatment of God. I digress long enough to say this. All of our social ills, and there are many as we have seen in the last month, all of our social ills are born out of one decision. One initial, original decision. Man has chosen to reject his creator. That's what's happened. Everything else has been born out of that fundamental misstep, that fundamental miscarriage, really, of justice, that we have not responded to God as individuals individually or as a race collectively as God deserves to be responded to. So, as Christians, what then do we do? Yes, we can and should share our insights and our opinions and our thoughts about racial inequality and injustice because there's been much of it and we should share our insights and our thoughts and our opinions about the resolution to that and we and we should share our insights and our thoughts and our opinions about the lawlessness that has ensued we should engage in the discourse but my friend our discourse goes farther because we have to be not only passionate to share our opinions about those things, we must be equally as actually more passionate about sharing the solution. And that is not just reconciliation with man. That won't happen. It can't happen until we reconcile with God. And that happens individually. And so our message to those who live near us, 
must not just be our opinion about how we got to this place, right? Why there's such tension between the races, why there's such tension within our society, why there ends up now being such lawlessness. These things aren't new and neither is the solution. And so we need to point people to the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And we'll see what he does in this passage because it all plays into it. So let's be passionate about that, that our only hope of reconciliation with man is that men, women, individuals would see their need to first be reconciled with God. Well, enough of that tangent, as important as it is. There is real guilt on every human being because of sin, and there is real con uh, consequence, excuse me, Paul refers to this guilt and this consequence by the word condemnation. It's a just and it's real and it's eternal condemnation, the condemnation of humanity by a just and holy God. And Paul paints a dreadful picture of that for us. He's done it for what? Every single sentence in the first seven chapters of the book of Romans, he's painted a picture of the dilemma and the consequence, our condemnation. He's also spoken of Jesus Christ as the solution to that. But today we come to a turning point in Paul's letter. He begins with the word therefore. It's like saying but, but now. So it's a turn. Though he shared everything that's truthful in the first seven chapters, now he says something has happened. After all of that, God can actually take and does our condemnation away. The first seven chapters describes why we are condemned, and then Paul starts chapter 8 and says, but i got to tell you something. God's taking the condemnation away. The holy just deserved condemnation. I'm guilty of so much wrong, so much sin. How can it be that he takes my condemnation away? But he does. Holy God, sinful man, condemnation, hope is lost. Or is it? Perfect Savior. Jesus crucified, Jesus riven, risen, justification by faith. Now what? No more condemnation because of those things. Life is restored. George Gertner, a young German man, found himself in North Africa in 1943. He was a part of the, German, the famous German general Rommel's great wave of infantry that swept through the Middle East and Africa during World War II. But George, along with many other Germans, was captured by the British, and the British handed him and many other German uh, prisoners of war over to the Americans who brought them stateside, and George happened to be placed in Fort Denning, Denny, excuse me, a prison camp in New Mexico. He thought, of course, I'm a condemned man. I'm a prisoner of war. I was a part of the Nazi war machine, and now for the rest of my life, I will live as a condemned man. That was his outlook, and it's understandable. But in 1945, George slipped past a guard, lifted up the fence, fled Fort Denny, excuse me, and found work as a sharecropper. He worked for this farmer and then for that farmer, always moving because he was terrified his bosses would discover he was a condemned man who had escaped, that he was actually part of the Nazi war machine. So he's always trying to avoid staying undercover so he could avoid U.S. authorities. Well, because he had played tennis quite well in Germany, at one point he left sharecropping and became a tennis instructor. He soon left that job again for fear of being found out. So he then became a ski instructor in the Rocky Mountains. In fact, in 1952, in 1952, there was a horrible train wreck at Donner Pass in the Rockies. And over 200 people were stuck on that train up in the pass in the dead of winter and their lives were at stake. And George actually was part of the ski patrol that got to the scene of the train accident and rescued all 200 people. He was part of those that saved their lives. But he still felt, someone's going to find out who I am. So he's got to move again. He told his wife, pack it all up. We've got to move immediately. Well, after 20 years of hearing the same thing from her husband, she finally said, no, we're not moving. Why is it that you're always so anxious, so paranoid? Why do we always have to move? And so finally, George sat his wife down and shared what he'd never told anyone about his participation in World War II as a German soldier. And he said, I actually am a condemned man. She looked at him and said, go to the Office of Immigration and Naturalization. George, the war's over. Go and tell them your story. So finally, at the age of 64, he turned himself in to authorities 
and spoke of his guilt. They released him from the charges and they actually made him a U.S. citizen. Well, that's an amazing story. But as I think about that story, what comes to my mind is, goodness, how many years of running? And ultimately, how many years of unnecessary running? And it gets me thinking. How much time do I spend? How many years have I spent thinking I'm a condemned man? and not fully entering into the freedom and the release, not release from God, but the release to God and all that he really has planned for me. How much of that have I missed? Seeing myself simply as a sinner who's condemned. And I wonder about you, how do you see yourself? Yes, a sinner, me too. But do we see the rest of the story that because of Jesus, God says now, though you have sinned and sinned miserably, you're no longer condemned. No longer condemned if you belong to Jesus. So, what are you guilty of? Maybe you've been caught and the word is out and people talk about you and they know of your failings. Or maybe nobody's aware of your failings. It's just a burden you carry on your shoulders and you think it's always going to have to stay there. Just this heavy burden of your own failure. I don't know what you've done, right? But we've all failed. Ultimately, though, it doesn't matter what people think about you or even what you think about yourself regarding your failure. What matters most is what God thinks and says about you. And this is what he says. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's what God says. Now, I'm going to put a pause right there. We're at my house. you got to deal with life in the Anderson house. You've probably heard the cat crying. He wants to let, get let in, so I'm going to open the door. Time out. Come on. Come on. There you go, Cheeto. All right. The cat's name is Cheeto, and sometimes the animals are just in charge. So we're going to come to... Romans, where was I? <laughs> to Romans chapter 8, right? What God gives us in the opening verses of Romans chapter 8, first four verses, we could call God's declaration of life. And I'm going to read it for you right now. Here's that opening line that we've already looked at. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Thank you, God. It's a beautiful passage. There's a lot in here. We're going to kind of just scratch the surface today but I'm trusting God's going to encourage you. There are actually three parts to God's declaration for those who know or who are in Christ. And I like to look at those three parts of this one declaration. The declaration is there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. What does that actually mean? Well, first of all, it means what it says. A, or first of all, excuse me, if you know Jesus Christ, you're no longer condemned by God. That's the first verse, as we've said. In our language, in our culture, condemnation typically refers to denouncing or criticizing the actions of another in a strong way. It's strong disapproval. That's what to condemn means. In the Greek language that Paul used to communicate, the word condemnation, though, refers to something more than that. It's actually the pronouncement of being guilty. To condemn is to pronounce someone guilty, but it's also to pronounce judgment over them, not just disapproval, but then to pronounce the judgment and carry out the sentence. So condemnation, it includes both the guilt and the experience, the actual punishment. In other words, God's condemnation of mankind, all of our rebellion, it involves pronouncing us as sinners and carrying out the experience of hell for all of eternity future. 
That's the full force of the condemnation leveled against us from a just and holy God. We're sinners who then will spend eternity separated from him in hell. Now, God is the one who condemns sinners, not Paul. We are all equally guilty, legally so, personally so, and as you can see, eternally so. So friends, our sin condemns us to eternal separation from God as a just penalty, and we deserve it. We don't like to think about that, but the beauty of what he's done for us in taking away the condemnation, it rises to its full importance and impact when we realize what our life was going to be like for all eternity future. So, if we've handed our life over to Jesus Christ, the condemnation has been removed. It's been lifted off of your head, off of my head. We're considered in Christ. That term means belonging to Christ. So if you've given your life to Jesus, said, I trust you for salvation. I trust you to be the one who forgives me. That means then God places you in Christ. Now, the Bible would say you belong to him. We talked about it, justification. You're not righteous, but because you've given your life to Christ, God declares you as righteous. And that then results in the condemnation being taken off of your head, off of your shoulders. John Piper says it this way, instead of almighty condemnation and omnipotent, continuous opposition, if you are in Christ Jesus, all of God's action toward you is now almighty mercy and omnipotent assistance. It's beautiful. See, God is now forever for you. He's not fickle, erratic. He's not arbitrary or moody. It's not as though that one day or one moment of one day he's for you and now you have his wrath leveled against you and the next minute or the next day he's, or he's against you and you have his wrath and then the next minute or the next day now he's for you, he feels good about you and you have his blessing. No, God is always for you. Always for you. Yes, there is discipline for God's children but that is different, altogether different in nature and intent. Wrath and condemnation is punishment. Period. Discipline is not punishment. Discipline is intended for growth. One is evidence of God's opposition. The other is evidence of God's commitment. And it's true. When he takes away the condemnation, he no longer opposes you. It's a beautiful thing. God is for you always. So, understand this. Your life, it was judged. If you're in Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, that means your life was judged and settled on the cross when Jesus died. And your life is not subject to retrial, regardless of Satan's continuous, insistent appeals. He'd love to repeal the verdict, but it can't be. There's no double jeopardy with God. He has declared you righteous in Christ if you've given your life to him. And part of that declaration of righteousness then becomes a declaration that you're no longer condemned. Eternity with him is your future not eternity in hell. So, your case was tried by the highest court. The case against you was closed in Christ. Because of him, you are not guilty. Because of Jesus Christ, Oswald Chambers puts it, we are now condemned to salvation. It's a great way of saying it. Rather than being condemned to damnation, we are condemned to salvation. That's a wonderful condemnation, right? As certain as our death was, so now is the certainty of our salvation unto a new and eternal life. So it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, where you've been, how far you've strayed, or how long you've stayed. It doesn't matter how dark your past or your present, or how clear the evidence against you, or convincing the people who accuse you. If you hand your life over to Jesus Christ, then by definition, God categorically declares, therefore, there's now no condemnation for you. Put your name in there. Because you are in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. Praise God, right? Doesn't get any better than that. Now, you notice there is a clarification, though. It's for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ, those who belong to Christ. Not everybody is able to say, there's no condemnation over my life anymore. Some people just don't belong to Christ. And you might say, well, isn't Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world? Yes, he is. But what that means is he's willing to take away the sins of the whole world. That's the offer. 
He makes forgiveness available to everybody. There's room in Christ for everyone. As John Piper says, Jesus is not a small hotel, right? There's room for everyone. So while the declaration of righteousness and the declaration of no more condemnation is given by God, he offers it to the whole world, but only those who say, I'd like it, actually receive it. That's important. Whoever believes, it says in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey, which is the consequence of believing, whoever does not obey or believe the Son shall not see life. But what will they see? The wrath of God, because it remains on him. Yes, he died for the sins of the world, but individually each person needs to step up and say, I believe it and I want it. Take away my, my condemnation. And he does. So, what you do with Jesus determines your eternity. And it's a permanent eternity either way. That's the meaning of eternity. If you die without Jesus, the results are tragic, my friend. Hell and all of its agony is your future. It's uncomfortable to think about that. It's agonizing to think about it. But it's true. There's no early release. There's no parole. There's no appeal. There's no recourse. It's done. It's over. If you don't have Christ and you die, it's over. So it is the question of a lifetime. Are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ? What will you do with Jesus? He wants you to embrace him. He wants you to belong to him. Embrace him, take him, receive the declaration of no more condemnation. Receive the declaration of being of being righteous in Christ. Let him take it. Let him take your condemnation. There's room for you. Trust him. So what will you do with Jesus? Which forever? Which forever will you choose? Well, it is a beautiful declaration. There's no condemnation. It really is beautiful. There's a second part to it. Not only does it mean that God removes the condemnation from our life, if you know Jesus Christ, you've been given a new kind of life. So with the removal of the condemnation comes a new life. It says in verse 2, because through Jesus Christ, or through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Let's explain that. Okay, because we've been justified, which was we place faith in Christ, God declares us righteous due to Jesus' behavior and on our own, right? In that, we receive a new life at the point of our justification. We all know we're born with what they say in Greek is bios or biological life. That's the life we all have biologically, right? But if we belong to Christ, we've been given another type of life that's called zoe, which is the life of the spirit. We have bios, now to that is added zoe, the life of Christ. Bios is life sustained, excuse me, if you will, by the blood that throws, uh, flows through our veins. I'm having trouble pronouncing words today. Bios, if you will, is life sustained by the blood that runs through our veins. Zoe is the life of the Spirit that God sustains. It's a new life. It's the expression of His life in us. When we talk about the Spirit of God who takes up residence in us, that's what we're talking about. It's His life. The life of the Spirit. It's when God decides that your life becomes his new home address. The life of the Spirit. The life of the Spirit. So first, if you know Jesus Christ, you're no longer condemned by God. Second, if you know Jesus Christ, you've been given a new kind of life. The life of the Spirit of God within you. And third, if you know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit within you, then does what? He doesn't just sit there and take up space. God, the Holy Spirit, enables you, empowers you, draws you into a new kind of living. A new kind of life, Zoe, a new kind of living, the life of the Spirit. So verse 1 is a declaration of no condemnation. Verses 2, 3, and 4 is a description of now this practical transformation. He'll spend the rest of chapter 8 explaining the transformation and how we walk in the newness of life. Today, we're just taking a little bit of a step into this chapter. So let's go back over the verses again, Romans 4, <laughs> excuse me, Romans 8, 1 to 4. Therefore, there is... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
There's no declaration. Excuse me. There's the declaration of no condemnation. Now here's the description of the transformation. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God's perfect law didn't create perfect people because in our flesh, we didn't care so much about the law. We were trying to do it on our own strength, and we always failed, right? So it proved to be what? Failure. Sin, more sin, and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So God sends his Son, who comes in flesh like ours, but he lives a perfect life, so he becomes the perfect sin offering. Now listen closely. So he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. How is the righteous requirement of God's law going to be fulfilled in us. Not by doing it on our own strength. It's through the life of the Spirit who's placed within us. Because he then says, we do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the Spirit enables us. That's the third part of the declaration, right? No condemnation ultimately ends up meaning we have a new life, not the old life. And in the new life, we have the Spirit within us who empowers us to live differently. Transformation. So, there's a gravitational pull towards sin. And that is replaced with a gravitational pull toward God as he plants his spirit within us. So that then, his aspirations for us to become like Jesus, that process of transformation now can happen. There's now a wanting. There's now a power in us that we feel and experience that we didn't have before. It's like the woman who said, Before I knew Jesus as my Savior, I hated my brother so much, I wouldn't even go to his funeral had he died. But now that I've come to Christ, I'd be happy to go to his funeral any day. <laughs> right? I love that little, that little illustration. But corny as that is, uh, there's truth to that, right? We can hate people with a passionate hatred. And then Christ gives us the opportunity to belong to him. We embrace him. We're given the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden that hatred, something begins to happen. It's like, I don't even want to hate anymore. That doesn't mean we don't struggle as Christians, but there is deeply within us, very really, truly, authentically within us, the spirit of Jesus Christ that that combats that fleshly spirit that continues to want to hate. And the spirit of Christ begins to say, no, 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 you don't even want that. You want to be unconditional in your love. You want to be forgiving of that brother, of that mother, of that spouse, of that ex-friend who did you wrong. And all of a sudden, you want to do things you wouldn't even think of doing before you came to Christ. So what accounts for the change? Zoe, the life of the Spirit within you. You might think of it this way. When you think about the, excuse me, the, um, you think about the coming of Christ, or excuse me, let me back up here. You think about the coming of God the Son to the earth, right? How did that happen? Well, the Spirit of God placed within the womb of the Virgin Mary, right? Jesus Christ in her womb. And nine months after he went through the same process of development within the womb that any other human being did, after nine months, she gives birth to Jesus Christ, right? God did the work of placing the seed within the woman. After nine months, she gives birth to Jesus. Spiritually speaking, the same thing has happened to you and me. We come to Christ. Now the spirit of Christ is placed within us and what then is born from us the very character qualities of life. So it's the same beautiful, if you will, implantation, right? We have the implanting of the Holy Spirit within us that gives birth to the life of Jesus Christ through us. That's what happens. So the Holy Spirit is the presence and the vitality and the dynamic life of Jesus lived through you and me. 
So when God says there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ, he's saying that our old life is now overtaken by a new life, a life of entirely dif a different order, a different kind, a different quality, not bios or biological life, but zoe, the life of the Holy Spirit in you. And that is Christ in you, and it's your hope of eternity with God. So chapter 7, as you saw a few weeks ago, it described the battle that we encounter against sin in the flesh. Now in chapter 8, it begins to explain how victory is actually won. And we'll, we'll spend more time on that in the next couple of weeks. We'll see how we can take the steps to experience victory. But the first piece of information necessary to win the battle over sin is to know, is to know that everything to do with your victory relies on the Holy Spirit of God who's been placed within you. He has made your life his home address. And just understanding that. The condemnation has been taken away and the spirit of Christ has been implanted. Just grab a hold of those truths. That's the first step toward walking in the newness of life. Major Ian Thomas says, Christ did not die simply that you might be saved from a bad conscience or even to remove the stain of past failure. Christ died to clear the decks for his divine activity through you. The end game is Christ's divine activity through you. That's why Christ came. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So, God has aspirations that you are transformed in the character likeness of Jesus, and his Holy Spirit in you ensures that it'll happen. So you can stop saying, oh, I'll be holy, I'll be right with God if I can just keep his commandments. No, you can't, that doesn't work. We begin to say instead, the law of God's spirit, God's very spirit lives in me. So dear spirit of the living God, we pray, take control in this moment of temptation. Take control in this moment where my flesh wants to go that way. Would you now take control and lead me in your way? And thank you that by your power, I can say no to temptation and sin, and I can say yes to godly behavior. So the question would be, what sin trips you up and drags you down? Where would you like to experience? If you could have victory today over something, what would it be? What sin, what attitude, what compulsion, what, what would you love to have victory over? Is there anger, resentment, division, conflict, strife? What expressions of your flesh, of your old self, seem to win the day most often? Listen, friend, with Christ in you, his spirit, we fight sin as victors, free from condemnation, not as victims with no options. Amen? I hope you see that. All right. I'd like to answer the question as we close. What difference does no condemnation make for us today. What difference does it make that we are now no longer condemned by God? Well, it means no condemnation in your moral failings. It means your failure isn't the last word. It means that if God can get over your sin, and he does because of Jesus, then you should get over your sin. Don't wallow in it. Yes, we need to be remorseful. But we need to stand out of that and say, thank you, God, you've taken away the condemnation. So how do you overcome the shame of your moral failure? Romans 8, 1. I'm no longer under condemnation for my failure. I trust Christ. So Christ is my pardon for what I did. So you'll remember Romans 8, 1. That's how you get beyond your moral failure. It, no condemnation, it means that there's no condemnation for my physical suffering. When you've been suffering and it only seems to get worse, maybe you're ill with cancer or some other malady, right? Maybe your life even takes on a Job-like, a Job-like existence. How will you overcome the thought that you tell yourself that somehow this is all your fault, that God has left you? Well, Romans 8, 1, that's what you bring to mind. I'm not under God's condemnation. Jesus took all condemnation for me. So God, through my pain and suffering, must be up to something that is ultimately good. Painful as it may be, He's going to use my pain and my suffering for his glory. 
So God, let your power be perfected in my illness. Let your power be perfected in my weakness. Let your will be done. You see, so a Christian who knows he doesn't live under condemnation doesn't think when he or she is sick that somehow God is punishing them. No, Romans 8, 1, there is no more punishment. Jesus took it all on the cross. So God, take this and use this. What difference does no condemnation mean? When your marriage becomes difficult, you may be feeling disappointed and deeply discouraged in your marriage today, even wronged by your spouse. Where will you find the courage and the humility to forgive and to continue loving when nothing is coming back to you in return? How will you keep repaying unkindness with kindness? How will you love and forgive in a difficult marriage? By remembering Romans 8.1. Because when you remember Romans 8, 1, you remember your God fully immersed you in an ocean of his grace, mercy, and forgiveness and love. And he placed all of your condemnation on his son. That's what you remember. And so now you have a pain-free eternity as a guarantee. Out of that same deep ocean, you can now choose just to, re just to retrieve a bucket full of that love, that mercy, that grace and pour it over your marriage. You can be the one, having been immersed in the love and the grace and the mercy of God, can now say, oh, Romans 8, 21, he bathed me in his grace, and now I'm just, I'm just gonna take some of that right out of that ocean of grace, and I'm gonna pour it over my marriage, over my spouse. I'm going to be, if you will, a fountainhead of grace and mercy and love. So how do you get beyond the pain and the discouragement? You remember, and then you apply Romans 8, 1. It means no condemnation as well in your parental failings. How will you respond when your children break your heart? You'll find plenty of reason to blame yourself. I know, I'm a, I'm a very imperfect parent. Sometimes I feel like a, a failure as a parent. I've wrestled with that a lot, even in the last couple of weeks. But how will you live with regret? The regret that you didn't do more for your children. Or maybe you regret some way in which you responded to your children or you've treated your children. How do you get beyond your failings as a parent? Because we all fail. Well, you get beyond it with Romans 8.1. When you grieve your mistakes as a parent, what you should have done that you didn't do, right, or anything else, you submerge yourself in that grace, the grace of God, who has chosen not to condemn you, but instead graciously he will lead you to humbly admit your failings to him and then to admit your failings to your children, seeking their forgiveness where it's needed, confident that God's spirit is a spirit also of healing and he can bring healing. So friend, whatever it is, Romans 8, 1, you go to that place. That's your bedrock. That's your foundation. You've been declared righteous by God because of Jesus' righteousness and now you are no longer condemned. That's the context of your life moving forward. God is committed to your transformation. And it begins with God laying that rock-solid foundation known as Romans 8, 21, where he declares, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, praise God. Soak in that this week. Amen? And we'll look at the rest of the chapter in coming weeks. God bless you today. that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior nailed to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who of her.
was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God is robbed the grave. Our God is robbed the so wonderful as always to be with you and as you enjoy the rest of your 4th of July weekend uh, remember the freedom that you've been given not only to live life in this country imperfect as it is but more importantly the freedom you've been given to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and to share the love of Jesus Christ with other people all right so walk with him this week and by the way this coming Friday night we've got our first of several family nights at Mission Hills there in the parking lot. So be sure to look for more information. You can find it on the website about that evening. If you are a parent of a child from birth to sixth grade, it'll be a wonderful evening. Lots happening also with our, our student ministries, Tuesday night and Wednesday nights, our life groups. Uh, we've got our new youth pastor, uh, Nick Sabio, beginning a week, uh, a week from now. So praise God, wonderful things are happening. Love you so much. We'll talk to you very soon.